BC Children's Hospital Dream Lottery, win this fabulous South Surrey home or 2.3 million tax-free cash. Tickets, bcchildren.com. Joining us now is our friend from The Athletic, Mr. Harmon Dial. His recent story is Elias Pettersson, a superstar. One question for every Canuck skater this season heading into training camp. Hey, Harm, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing really well, guys. How are you? Yeah, very well. Great to see you at the ball game last week and uh, look forward to a new hockey season. Love the story idea you put together here. Let's start with the guys in the headline. Elias Pettersson, is he a legitimate superstar or nothing more than an average first line center. Explain. Yeah, so I think we've all seen from the first moment Patterson joined this team as a rookie and he burst out of the gate with 10 goals in his first 10 games, we saw the potential in him as one of the rare types of players that can single-handedly change a franchise franchise's fortunes. And for his first couple seasons, right through the 2019-20 season, he really flashed that kind of potential. I mean, to be a sophomore player and lead one of the best first lines in the NHL to be essentially point, point per game, just shy of that, in addition to having a really strong two-way impact, to be productive through, through the playoffs, I think we all looked at that and, and said, if he's already doing that as a sophomore, Lord knows what his ceiling could be once he's in his mid-20s. And obviously, in the last couple of seasons, he hasn't been able to take that next step. He hasn't been able to sustain that peak level of play that he's been able to flash, right? And we do see it in spurts. Obviously, in the second half of last season, I think he put up, what, uh, uh, scored at a 50-goal, 97-point pace. But that doesn't matter when you're when the first half of your season is um, relative to his expectations. It was a, a da- disaster, right? And so I think this is maybe the third year where we're really waiting for that really big, massive breakout. And it matters for a couple of reasons, right? For, for starters, even from a team building perspective, the the level Pedersen can can reach affects how strong the rest of your roster needs to be in order to be a legitimate Stanley Cup contender down the line. And what I mean by that is a team like Edmonton needs a lower quantity of stars compared to a team like Carolina, right? You don't need to have six to eight all-star caliber players on your roster when McDavid and Drysaddle can single-handedly win a playoff series, as opposed to a team like Carolina, if your best player is Sebastian Ajo, Sebastian Ajo is not a superstar, and you've seen in the last couple of postseasons, Carolina, for as deep as they are in their top nine, lines one to three, for two straight postseasons, they haven't been able to score enough. And and Rod Brendamore most recently was lamenting the fact that, they, hey, we don't have an elite goal scorer. Maybe we need that, right? And so that's where you look at Pedersen in the grand scheme of building this Canucks roster, and you say he's the one mm-hmm. piece that has real superstar potential for the next for the next five to ten years. And that's where it's it's, I think, integral for him to get to that point because if he's not that guy, if Pedersen's just a 70, 75-point center, um, an average 1C, then it's then you're going to need a lot more help around him mm-hmm. to to be a real juggernaut. And, and the other thing, the other perspective it sort of matters from is obviously from a contractual standpoint. Um, he's up in two years, and with the cap potentially spiking a year earlier, the Canucks are going to have to make this big bet on whether he's their franchise guy. And Mm -hmm. he needs to prove that that's exactly what he is. Yeah, well, we know that cap is scheduled to go up in 24-25, which is when Elias is an RFA with Arb Wright. So that seems to play into the Canucks' hands harm. But I noted your tweet last night, something that may not play into the Canucks' hand. Tage Thompson re-signs in Buffalo 7.1 for seven years. Josh Norris gets nearly 8 by 8 from the Ottawa Senators, and Robert Thomas at 8.125 over 8 from the St. Louis Blues, and none of those guys had hit a 50-point season until they had big breakouts. Your point, young top six centers can command serious coin after just one dominant season, and Elias may have several dominant seasons and more points than the trio that we just talked about. I think the big big wondering here, Harm, is what will Elias Pettersson look like in the playoffs, like a real playoffs, uh, on a year by year basis, if the Canucks can get to a place where they're at the in the playoffs every year for four or five straight years, as you know, good teams tend to do when they find their proper core and the depth and all that, 
what's he going to look like? Because if he's a difference maker in the playoffs, he's worth all the money in the world. Is Elias Pettersson going to be that player in the playoffs? I think he showed that potential in 1920. And obviously it's different with the bubble and, and whatnot. But you look at the teams that the Canucks went through in that in that style. Minnesota, St. Louis, Vegas. Those were three of the biggest teams in the Western Conference. And we saw the way that they were targeting Pedersen. I mean, we all remember sort of the Ryan Hartman moments on, on thing, Pedersen. Yeah. And they tried to really grind him down and really didn't seem to phase him, right? I mean, you look at his production throughout that throughout those three rounds. He was pretty consistent throughout. And again, that was just as a sophomore, right? And there's room there for him where he needs to, of course, continue to slowly become stronger. And he's going to do that as he matures into his frame. He, I think, I honestly really believe that he can get there. He's, he's gone off track the last couple of seasons, of course. I think um, when you look at last season, maybe obviously the wrist injury sort of uh, recovering from that looms large and a player like Pedersen, his game is very rhythm and timing and, and reads and brain oriented as opposed to being faster and, and, and having these dominant physical tools like a McDavid or a McKinnon. And so for that reason, I think you can, it doesn't excuse why he had a slow first half, but you can understand why it happened. And so for that reason, I'd be bullish on him being that sort of difference maker, not only in the regular season, but through the playoffs. Uh, but he's going to have to prove it. And I think the biggest question more than his play on the ice is the durability of lasting through four rounds. I think if anything, that could be yellow flag or that could be a legit question mark because if he's healthy and if he's playing at his best then I do think he's the sort of player that can put his team put the team on his back through playoff rounds your piece also hits on another player that we've also we had these similar thoughts what can you realistically expect out of JT Miller if he is a Vancouver Canuck you throw aside the the will he or won't he be here question 99 points is not what JT Miller is I, I just don't see him as a 99 point player great that he got there but how do you replace, and I thought you put it perfectly in your piece, I think 82 points is a far more realistic landing spot for JT Miller this year, and that's a loss of 17 points. So who's going to bring up those 17 points? And maybe it's the aforementioned Elias Pettersson, but those 17 points have to come from somewhere. Yeah, well, it, the thing to keep in mind is the where you could see the drop-off in points is is on the power play, right? Because Miller ranked behind only McDavid and Drysaddle last year with 38 power power play points. Now, if the regression happens from from there, that's okay because you don't need one guy to to be the sole driving force of, of the man advantage. And, and the example that I, I sort of referenced was in, in 2019-20, for example, Vancouver's power play was second in the league in total goal scored. And it was the same setup, essentially, with Miller sort of playing the left half wall as, as the primary quarterback. And so in that year, Miller only had, I think, 25 power play points, right? So 13 fewer significant drop off, but it didn't affect the overall units production because a player like Leas Pedersen was dominant and the, the rest of the players were just able to kind of pick up the slack. And I think from that standpoint, as long as Miller's five on five production stays constant, which if you look at if you look at it from that standpoint, I think Miller was around 27th in, in the league, uh, tied with Co Connor Garland, actually, among NHL forwards, four or five and five points. So I think something like that is sustainable. And yeah, you could see some regression on the power play, but that's okay if, if someone like Patterson or someone like Besser can help uh, pick up the slack. Oliver Ekman Larson is another player who I think is in the spotlight as we head into training camp. And your question about him harm was, Will he see any time on the right side? And we've kicked this around too, the, that, you know, maybe you solve some of your right side problems immediately with that move. You kind of shift them over to the left side, although the left side theoretically... That's how tenuous things yeah, are. <laughs> well, I mean, theoretically, the left side should be easier to fix in the long run because the left shooting defenseman is is the more abundant commodity, but pick up on Oliver Ekman Larson and, and whether or not you see any kind of wisdom to try and cross train this 30 plus year old on the right side now. Yeah. So like you guys mentioned, shifting OEL to the right side, it, it would, I would 100% be worried about the left side and trying to field a, a second, a competent second pair. But the, the reason I sort of wondered about this was I thought of Luke Shen, right? And he filled in really admirably next to Hughes. And, and it's quite po a possible, I think, that he slots in the top four again. But Shen doesn't have an extensive history over the last few years of playing in a top four role. And I don't know if you guys remember preseason last year, but 
This is a guy who his foot speed seemed to be a bit of a concern then, and he started the year as a healthy scratch, right? So Shen wasn't signed initially to be a top four guy to caddy for Hughes. The fact that he did it is fantastic. And if he can maintain that level of play again this season, then 100% I'd be comfortable going with Hugh Shen. But it isn't a guarantee, right? Especially he turns 30, 33 in the fall. And I look at Shen and his performance last season and think, he punched above his talent level and that realistically Shen is best suited for a sort of third pair role. Again, if he can maintain the same way that he played last year, great. I'll, I'll, I'll slot him again with Hughes, but you have to be prepared for at least the possibility that maybe he won't be able to play against top players and be a genuine top four guy again for you. And if then you think about your contingency options and they're not great, right? Plan B, I mean, you could go with Tucker Pullman, but his health status is, is up in the air. And then once you go beneath Pullman, then you think about guys like Tyler Myers and Travis Dermott, both of whom would not be ideal stylistic fits with Hughes because Myers and, and Dermott are also sort of pot carrying sort of guys that don't like to play the stay at home sort of style that is probably best suited as a fit next to Hughes. And then that's where you think about, okay, could OEL be that sort of plan B or plan C option on a top pair because OEL has history and of playing on the right side. And maybe it's not even necessarily OEL, but Hughes has, I believe from his days in college and a little bit of history with um, the U S international team playing the right side as well. So could one of those guys shift to the right side and, and that, and you really load up the top pair and, and maybe it's not even on a full-time basis, but per perhaps you use it situationally when, let's say, the team's down a goal and, and you need to create some offense in the third period and, and maybe you stack your best talent together. So that's the sort of thing that I've been wondering about, especially in light of Pullman's health status up in the air right now. Yeah, no, um, heck, uh, even maybe Quinn Hughes on the right side at some point, as we discussed with Jeff Patterson. Try him uh, all. Last week. Well, I mean, you know, he's such a marvelous talent. You know, you would think that the most talented guy would have the best success, right? Moving over to the right side. Harm, just That's quickly, what do you think on Hughes? Eventually yeah. Eventually on the offside. Personally, I think he'd, I have no doubt that he'd be successful there. The question is, could he sort of maintain that elite level performance? And like you kind of mentioned, there's two, usually two frames of thoughts when you have this, this debate about which guy do you shift over to play his offside? Because on the one hand, like you kind of noted, it's easy to look at Hughes and say he's the most talented, so he's the most likely to succeed. But then there's also, you could also argue from another perspective, and I don't know which perspective is right here. You could also argue that why would you handicap or undermine your best defenseman's ability to be, be your best defenseman. And given the given given how weak the Canucks are from two to six on the blue line and how much of a load Hughes needs to carry as the number one guy and he needs to be elite, why would you necessarily want to risk him not yeah. playing up to his ability level? Why would you want to screw around with that? So yeah. you, can, you, can have, you can look at it from both perspectives. I don't know what the best option is right now. I would say this. I think you that's the sort of thing you answer in training camp and in preseason and maybe even in the start of the season if you want to experiment with it and try both guys. And it's tough to really know which would be the better option sitting now in, in August. Before you go, Matt knows I love a good B-side. So we're going to go to a B-side player, if you will. And a player that we've talked about the Canucks trading just to liquidate cap space, but it looks like he's going to be a player for the Vancouver Canucks. So then you have to decide, okay, well, then how do you get the most out of said player and maybe create him as an asset for a trade deadline move? And I'm talking about Tanner Pearson in that, you know, it'd be great to get the $3 million off the books, but if you're going to have him, then you got to use him, and you probably have to use him well so that maybe he becomes an asset for you down the road this season. How do you think they deploy Tanner Pearson now that they've got new toys to play with in the top nine? Is he a forgotten man, or do you think he's still just a guy that coaches love and he'll find his way into, uh, into a beneficial position? I still think he's a sort of player that coaches just love. He's sturdy along the boards, retrieves the puck consistently, and rarely makes a mistake. And when you can do that, when you're extremely dependable, coaches really value that above, let's say, a player like Niels Hoaglander last season, who he's capable of making the home run play, but you also don't know whether he's going to be able to responsibly go start start of a shift, end of a shift without making a mistake. Yeah. And Pearson also seemed to fit really well in Boudreaux's sort of aggressive forechecking style. So when I think about the increased competition of the wings, 
100%, he, Pearson's going to face increased competition because of Mikheyev coming in, because of Kuzmenko, and, and Hoaglander's still going to be hungry, and Pod Colson could take the next step. So it's not going to be handed to Pearson, but I still believe that he has the inside track because of how well he fit sort of stylistically and because he's he's the safer sort of player that coaches tend to value. The one thing I'll say is deployment-wise, I don't want to see him with Elias Patterson. That it just has never, ever worked when you think about the rare instances when they've played together. But Pearson seemed to fit well with Miller at points last season. He seemed to, you know, he's always had success in, in a sort of checking line role with with Horvat at, at certain points. The thing to keep in mind is with Pearson is he needs to maintain... Like if he's the player that he was two years ago in 2021, that's that's where you wonder about him maybe potentially sliding and, and could there be an opportunity for a, a Kuzmenko or a Hoaglander to jump him on the depth chart. If he plays the way he did last season, I still think he's going to earn a prominent middle six role next to someone like someone like a Bo Horvat just mm. because of his two-way reliability. I think you're probably right. I think there's people who are going to be pushing there and... Yes, it would be terrific if he could rehabilitate some trade value. Like, yeah, yeah. Alas, uh, you know, money being as tight as it is, boy, you know. But again, then you got to give him the trust to give him, well, put him in a good I, uh, position, yeah. right? So, Harmon, wonderful hearing your voice again. Thank you, my friend. We'll catch up soon. Thank you, guys.